The one thing constant in Halan is decay. Meat rots, turning grey and putrescent. Flowers wilt, vibrant colors going dull and leaves dropping. Minds erode, memories fading and simple acts becoming out of one's reach. And the lotus court? That jewel of Rahem, a place of vast feasts and incredible gardens. And all the most brilliant minds of the ministries working in one place? It is an institution surpassing most of Halan, and its decay is similarly distinguished. Corruption that siphons off the wealth of an entire continent. Internal politicking with stratagems and tactics that rival any of Jaher's campaigns, all in pursuit of personal power. A veritable legion of administrators who are as short-sighted and petty as the oracle at Tugayasa is far-seeing. These problems have only festered under the rule of Indranayar and may soon spell the demise of the Harim Raj. It will take work rivaling any of Harimar's deeds to restore the Raja's authority, purge the ministries and repair all that has crumbled in the interim. But if it can be done and Rahen reforged, the Lotus Court may shine brighter than ever before and the Harim Raj with it. Hi everybody! So, you've decided to play Denijan Raj, have you? <laughs> Here's a broken country and a disaster, good luck. Aside from the plethora of unique estates and mechanics, the Raj and its new interface and the bickering swarm of vassals, Denijan Raj starts in a very precarious situation. Handling the initial conditions in a right way is paramount to a successful campaign. The very first priority is to get rid of the Lotus Court disaster. I have played this twice already. The first time it took me almost half a century to get out of it. The second time it only took about 15 years, which I assume is the intended time. Therefore, before anything else, let me guide you through this disaster, if you intend to give this nation a chance. And I strongly recommend that you do, because the level of options that the Raj campaign has despite its demanding mission tree is quite amazing. Straight from the date of 11th of November 1444, you can see a part of the problem. The nation is led by Raja Indranayar of the Lotus Claw. He is a one-to-one -one ruler with the kind-hearted, craven and naive enthusiasm traits. The minus 5% morale of armies from Craven is one of the bigger problems after the severe lack of stats. Thankfully he is 84 years old, so he won't survive that much. He has no heir, so the follow-up to his rule is a lottery. Corruption starts at 15 and increasing due to some reasons we will speak about in a second. Among other things, this applies a 15% extra all power cost from the get-go, which is awful. It is also a constant drain on the nation's coffers due to the fact that one must maximize rooting out corruption and even doing that does not decrease it, it's bad. Crown land starts at only 15%, which makes all vassals get 50% extra liberty desire from development. In the initial context of the Raj, this is very bad, due to the fact that the Raj cohesion will suffer for every subject with more than 40% liberty desire. The Ministry Territorial Management privilege prevents ministries from losing lands when clicking the Seize Land button, which makes the problem worse. The ministry's estate starts at almost 100% influence and an equilibrium of almost 60%. Denizhan Raj starts with only 5 provinces and with a decent army of 22,000 troops in the field, but with a manpower pool of only 8,000 and a maximum manpower of 16,000 for a force limit of 55,000 men. This is abysmal, especially that all the Synaptia are dancing on the edge of disloyalty. The Raj cohesion starts at 30 and dropping. Disloyal subjects, ministry influence throughout the Raja's subjects and Indranayar stats do not help. The Grand Vizier has very good stats to balance the starting cohesion slightly. But this also drastically increases their passive sway gain. The capital province of Denizhan Sar is a fairly developed urban province with a level 2 center of trade. It has two beneficial special modifiers, one is a temple complex which grants half a ducat a month and the other is the royal barracks which adds some manpower and defensiveness together with some local supply limit. A welcome bonus but not nearly enough. The elephant in the room are the four nasty corrupt ministries modifiers in the province. The corrupt ministry of agriculture makes development 20% more expensive and reduces national tax income by 33%. The Ministry of Philosophy makes advisor cost 25% more and increases corruption by 0.5 yearly. The Ministry of Internal Relations lowers income from vassals and increases their liberty desire by 15% each. Finally, the corrupt Ministry of Foreign Relations reduces the diplomat pool by 1 and reduces the total relationship slots by 3 to a maximum of 1, which is occupied by the March of Tugayasa. Together, the four modifiers add 20% influence to the Ministry's estate. They can only be removed via decisions and each decision has a complex set of demands that must be met. 
Oh, you think this is bad? Well, we haven't even removed the pause yet. Just as soon as the first month is over, the disaster of the Lotus Court fires and Raja immediately loses 50 legitimacy points, because why not? The disaster hurts manpower advisor costs, diplomatic reputation, yearly legitimacy gain and income from vassals. All power costs are an additional 5% more expensive and liberty desiring subjects is increased by a further 10%. Yearly corruption increases by an extra 0.5 yearly. Administrative efficiency is decreased by 50% too, but at this point who cares anymore? The Lotus Throne is not doing any sort of conquering anytime soon. With all the modifiers combined, the advisor cost granted by the Ministry's ceremonial ruler privilege is pretty much annulled. All power costs are increased by 25%, which is one of the worst ones. Technology cost is further increased by Harimari administration, so learning any new technologies will not happen very soon. Developing for crown land, liberty desire reduction or institutions is extremely expensive, having a total 55% development cost penalty from all the initial Denizian Raj modifiers. All subjects have a plus 35% extra liberty desire before adding up development, the lack of diplomatic reputation and other modifiers. Corruption would increase even at 3 stability with maximum rooting out cost. Gaining 3 stability cannot be done very easily either. While the disaster is active and the Ministry of Agriculture is not reformed, then crumbling infrastructure modifiers will randomly be applied to provinces within the Raj, in the Raja's provinces or its subjects. These must be removed by an army present in the province and each removal costs administrative power and some cash. The corrupt Minister of Philosophy will also spawn suspicious ministry offices in a similar fashion, which also need to be removed. Hovering over the fixed infrastructure and investigate local ministries will highlight the affected provinces on the map. It's bad, true, but every obstacle can be overcome. A word of warning is that a lot of the early footage is from my first campaign which was less efficient, but I will describe the best way that I personally used to handle the disaster and edit it relatively quickly. Before you unpause, I suggest deleting both starting forts. They are unnecessary and drain your coffers for no reason. You can make the ruler into a general, but there is no time for drilling. Indranayar is old enough that he should die within the first year naturally anyway, but if he has decent siege pips, it's worth using him in the field. Maximize root out corruption, of course. Rival the command and insult them immediately for a bit of power projection. Call a diet for the estate agenda. Try to get a higher advisor or reduce liberty desire mission from the ministries or something like spy on the command. Be careful with the estates. My formula is the following. To the middle castes, offer monopoly of school renovations for prestige, importance of commerce and indebted to the middle class for some free money. To the upper castes, offer call inter-caste council, mainly for extra major state influence and increased school tuition for loyalty and tax income. To the lower castes, oversight over lower castes and restricted food imports are the privileges to choose. It is important to get the mages above 33% influence somehow. Mages start at base 10, with 10 more from the upper caste privilege, and 5 more from the first diet. So you need 10 more. There is a real chance to get a mage conclave event for 20% extra influence, and a hired mage advisor also gives them 5% extra influence, but you can't rely on random chance. You might find yourself having to offer the patronage of the magical arts and the reduced research regulation privileges to get over the threshold. As soon as the 33% threshold is reached, cast the internal scrying spell for 10% liberty desire reduction in subjects and then immediately revoke the reduced research regulation privilege because nothing is gained if you keep the minus 2 diplomatic reputation malice. This will put you at 10% crown land, which is okay. Seizing land is inefficient due to the ministries and we can't really waste any power points on development. We are done with the estates for now. In the Raj interface, choose the increased ministerial controls for 10% extra liberty desire reduction. Ordering a census is tempting, but it will cost a large amount of power points overall, so I don't think it's worth it right now. Hire mercenaries. I chose the independent army and the bloody tusks. The gangs of Sarisung might work as well. Their morale malice makes them quite bad, but if they have a general with siege pips, they are worth it and relatively cheap in comparison to other options. The troops will be used for sieges and intimidation, not so much for fights. Set a manpower edict in the capital. This will bump your total maximum manpower pool by 15% thanks to the royal barracks in Denizhansar. I would recommend not choosing a power focus just yet. We will have to work on the ministry reforms from day one. Each of them has a number of conditions and each condition has a specific weight. Reaching 40 weight points will allow the reform to pass. The least impactful and easiest to complete is the Ministry of External Affairs, so let's start with that. 
After the setup is done, feel free to unpause and move your armies north. Declare a humiliation war on the command as soon as possible. They will only get stronger, so there's no time like the present. Declare on the 11th of December, so that your Senapti don't get to declare any other wars. Winning a war against the command weighs 20 points, so half the requirements for the reform. Beeline for the capital. Try to avoid fighting hobgoblin armies unless you have clear superiority of numbers. But do try to fight smaller armies for the necessary superiority. The Senapti should prove to be a good distraction. If the command wastes time sieging their provinces, you should be good. If they do go deeper and start sieging your few provinces, there is a high chance that they will destroy the temple complexes in the provinces of Durasideni or Maharaja. It's not the end of the world, but it's better to be avoided. Their capital is in the plains that should fall relatively easy. After that, avoid their large stacks and try to capture as much land as you can, until they're willing to peace out. Just take some money to win the war and that's half of a reform in the bag. As soon as the war is over, give the middle castes the land of commerce privilege for the plus one diplomana, then wait for the statutory rights event. It should arrive soon and will give back 30 crown land. The upper castes will get statutory rights privilege for 20 years, which is not so bad. Having the crown land at 30% will solve some liberty desire issues for now and Raj cohesion increase will accelerate. The Raja will die soon. Try to get a new leader with a total amount of stats of at least 12. A high diplomacy Raja is particularly important to reforming the Ministry of Foreign Affairs quickly. You can get 15 points from 10 monthly diplomatic power points and 5 from royal marrying a non-Raj country. The problem is your lonely diplomatic slot, which makes a royal marriage use up one monthly power point. You can simply take loans and upgrade a diplomatic advisor to reach the required diplomatic mana income, reform the ministry, then fire them, or revoke March status from Tugayasa and free up your diplomatic slot. Do not focus on diplomacy unless your new ruler has a high imbalance against diplomatic mana gain. Another relatively easy 5 points are from an ally with 70 trust. The easy first royal marriage and alliance is the Harimari nation of Bim Lao to the southeast. In the meantime, improve relations with the nation that follows the Orange Sash school. This is necessary to invite an Orange Sash scholar. This school grants much needed bonuses to yearly legitimacy gain and corruption decay, both crucial at this stage of the game. If you reform the ministry, then Rajnadaga to the north is a good easy target for the alliance. They follow the Orange Sash school and can be used as a buffer against future wars with the command. Also, keep your mercenaries on the move through the Raj and investigate suspicious ministries to reduce corruption and add case power for later. You may reduce your army maintenance while doing this because it will not affect the mercenaries. When the suspicious ministries are investigated, there is a chance that rebels will spawn, so the mercenaries will take their personal manpower hits, saving your own pool. With the extra diplomat, increase opinion of Rabi Daraj the Vizier to the maximum possible bonus. This is necessary for a future mission and should be done sooner rather than later, before sway increases too much. The Ministry of Internal Affairs is the second fastest to reform. This one requires a high military point generation and a combination of maximum stability, high Raj cohesion and legitimacy. Peace in the Empire and low subject liberty desire also add up. Some combination of points to reach 40 is not impossible to achieve. After the Ministry of External Affairs is reformed, feel free to demand introspection in the Raj menu for a temporary peace in the realm. This will give some extra cohesion and the peace bonus, for example. Reaching maximum stability is also not that bad, due to the fact that the rigid caste bonus and the high philosophy religion do offer a combined 40% discount on stability increase, despite all the horrible mana draining malices that Denishan Raj must suffer. The Ministry of Agriculture cares about development and the lower castes. Administrative power gain is relevant here. All neglected infrastructure must be removed for 15 points, so this task has the biggest weight. Fixing infrastructure will be a drain on the administrative power pool. After taking the decision, you need to park an army in the province for a total of 5 months for the infrastructure to be fixed. If crumbling infrastructure appears in your own provinces, it must be addressed first. In subject lands, they may sometimes take the decision themselves, which saves you the initial costs, but then you might need to move an army into the province for the necessary 5 months to complete the repairs. The 10 developed farmlands task is also relatively simple. You have one farmland province and your subjects will slowly develop their lands too. If you notice farmland provinces with 16-17 development, then click to develop them. If not, it might be wise to wait a bit longer while you complete other tasks. With no neglected infrastructure and no loans, you already have 20 points. 
with enough administrative power point gain and 10 developed farmlands, a high income or loyal lower castes should have enough to pass the reform. Might even choose to divert trade from subjects temporarily to increase your income just enough to get the final 5 points. The Ministry of Philosophy is all about the relationship with the religion and the ministry's estate. It may be the most difficult to reform. This one requires gathering case strength from events and hunting suspicious ministries to reduce corruption. These two are the easiest of tasks. Inviting three scholars is too slow because you may invite one only once every 10 years. To reform this ministry you will have to appease the upper castes and curtail the ministries. This means you need to avoid summoning further diets to avoid increasing ministry influence more than strictly necessary. Investigating suspicious local ministries will also temporarily decrease their influence and multiple investigations stack. Removing the Ceremonial Ruler Act privilege will reward 10 points and also remove the 5% all power cost penalty from it. But try to remove it when you need the final 10 points to avoid having to pay too much for your advisors for an unnecessary amount of time. Reducing corruption to less than 1% and appeasing the upper castes will grant you 20 points and the last 10 points will be fulfilled by the case strength gathering task. This will be gathered over time from events and through investigating suspicious ministries. If gathering the necessary points lasts too long, the subjects who reach admin tech level 4 will start building schools in their lands and that will add 5 points to the total, which are usually enough. After a monumental amount of effort, the court is finally reformed. The nobles are listening, the ministries are governing, the foreign office is conferencing and the military is preparing. This bodes well for the future. The lotus court blooms like the eponymous flower and its brilliant colors will mesmerize her less and force it to kneel before its splendor. Even if the available footage doesn't show it, my personal best time is 1457 for ending the corruption of the lotus court. Let's take a deep breath, relax and take a look at Denis Jean Raj's ideas. Their ideas focus on unrest reduction, military prowess and support heavy vassal play. They get plus 2 tolerance of the true faith and plus 1 yearly legitimacy in their traditions which are complemented by plus 1 unrest reduction. That combines nicely with the Golden Palace score which lowers unrest by a further 2 points. They receive 10% infantry and cavalry combat ability, minus 10% shock damage received and 10% extra manpower. These give the Raj armies a slight edge early to mid game. From a vassal play point of view, they receive a whopping 33% extra income from vassals, which is enormous when you count the fact that there is no limit to the number of Prabia. They receive a 20% reduction to diplomatic annexation cost, which is again very very powerful. This, combined with the influence idea set bonus and the influence administrative policy, can reduce annexation cost by 65%, 70% if we add a mage advisor and so on. One problem is the lack of access to the nobility annexation privilege which would normally prevent diplomatic reputation penalties after annexation. To mitigate that a bit, Denis Jean Raj does receive a plus one diplo rep in their ideas. Finally, they may use one extra diplomatic policy for free, which is potentially nice but depends on the available policies. An unimpressive 10% extra tax income wraps up the national idea set. Now let's finally take a look at the Raja's government. Its unique tier 1 reform seriously stifles governing capacity with a 50% penalty and this allows diplomatic vassalization of foreign nations. The Raja is able to force vassalized most neighbors with a unique CB offered by high Raj cohesion, but as a counterweight they may not declare conquest wars for their subjects claims. Minus 20 maximum absolutism does not affect the early game at all. The second tier offers two great options. Magical Elite and the unique Harimari upper caste are both great picks. The former offers powers to the mage state and seriously increases the chance for gaining powerful mage heirs. The latter offers 5% core creation cost and idea cost discounts. Spending government reform progress after taking the tier 2 reform must be avoided though. Ending the corruption of the Lotus Court disaster will immediately grant the third reform. Restructured Denijan Sari Court grants a strong monthly autonomy reduction bonus and one more promoted culture together with a 100 government capacity bonus. The fourth reform can be obtained from a decision available post-disaster. The Consolidate the Raj decision requires either high development or a small number of subjects. Gaining development is easy to do through conquest and through annexing a few large vassals. The rest of the criteria can be easily achieved. Consolidating the Raj will counteract the tier 1 governing capacity malice and will make the ministries loyal in your nations and more influent in subjects with the effect of improving Raj cohesion gain. 
In conclusion, saving government reform progress after tier 2 will slingshot your government into the fifth reform after consolidating the Raj. The mission tree which opens up after the disaster is vast, confusing and strange at times. It really feels like having to deal with a cat that meows in front of a door. You open the door to let the cat out and then it just sits there looking at you. What do you want, cat? What do you want? There are totally missions that you need to prepare for a bit during the disaster. One is rein in vizier power, which requires a competent and loyal vizier with 200 opinion and low sway. If you end the disaster fast enough and have improved relations with Rajna Daga, this one should be ready to complete immediately. The other mission is new cadre of ministers, which requires level 3 advisors across the board and the ministry estate with influence lower than 70 and loyalty higher than 60. This means avoiding diets for a while and a bit of luck. Seizing crown land should also be used sparingly before this mission. The advisors received after reforming various ministries are 75% cheaper to employ, so those will serve well for the completion of the mission. The mission branches on the left and the right edges concern themselves with expanding the Raj to the southwest and to the northeast. Once cohesion is high enough, the conquests may begin. The Ragamidesh states to the south are relatively isolated and should be added to the Raj first. Additionally, conquering the Jadari is also wise. They tend to be very expansionist, so having them be part of the Raj early will slow them down a bit and they are a strong synapti to have, especially early game. In the northeast, the ruined states will be worthy subjects as well, while the command lands should be personally annexed by the Raja. The same applies for the city of Sarisung. Buvauri to the east will be a major threat. Tenijan Raj gradually gains permanent claims on their lands, but they can also be subjugated with the expander RCB. While subjugating them is a quick solution to completing the related missions and gaining access to Bomdan, Buvauri has a historical rivalry with Raja, which results in a permanent 50% extra liberty desire. That will be a challenge to overcome and it makes annexing them a very very high priority. There is a serious amount of development involved in the mission tree. Most of the development that is required is in provinces that belong to your subjects or enemies, so you might want to choose to annex them and then develop the respective provinces. Later in the mission tree, you are tasked to conquer all of Rahen and the Jade Mines owned by the command, then Bomdan and Upper Yan Shen. But there is a twist. No major nation would be complete without a horrible mid-game disaster and Denis Janoraj is no exception. The Blood Lotus Rebellion is a human reaction to the oppressive caste system organization and, even though not specific to this nation, it does mark the campaign in a dramatic way. In my case, it fired sometimes in the late 16th century. It can be triggered by the reform the caste decision or by simply owning many Raheni culture provinces. It demands a lot of diplomatic and military mana, both of which should be pooled in advance of the disaster, and it is a serious tax on a nation's manpower pool. At peace, in normal conditions, war exhaustion goes down by 0.1 per month, but while this disaster is active, it will continuously increase passively. It will also be increased regularly through events, and it is twice as expensive to reduce manually. This is also a problem due to the fact that there are no diplomatic power points to spare. Manpower recovery will grind to a halt and mercenaries will prove to be quite necessary during this disaster. Minus 30% loyalty of the castes exacerbate the manpower issues even more and contribute to higher unrest for a potential of plus 9 total, not counting the massive stability hit when the disaster fires and the doubled stability increase cost. When the disaster fired, the two choices presented to me were the Emancipation choice, which granted minus 2 unrest mitigation during the disaster and the 4 stability points hit, versus the Harimari hardline option with an additional plus 3 unrest and a 5 stability hit, but with a reward in the form of a great general. I am unsure if this choice has any other effects during the disaster, but the Emancipation choice sounds like the more sane option. During the disaster, you are tasked to switch to the trade map mode and run around your lands to question Blood Lotus supporters using diplomatic mana and to destroy Blood Lotus cells using military mana. These appear on the trade map mode from the start and more reveal themselves in time. That's all there is to it, really. There is no active way to end the disaster. You must simply destroy the rebel cells as fast as possible and wait for the new ones to appear until a final wave of rebels spawn. The only positive thing that I can say about this disaster is that it is a very good gateway into the court and country immediately after. The accrued war exhaustion and lack of stability are perfect to lead into the court and country disaster by declaring a random war and fighting it for 3 years. With a collection of unrest reduction of Denijan Raj, getting court and country is quite difficult otherwise. 
but that also means that you must prepare to get rid of all unnecessary estate privileges before the Blood Lotus Rebellion and switch out of the uh, Land of Adventurers organization of the Adventurer Estate to be able to reach 85 maximum absolutism before you fire the second disaster for maximum gain. The middle mission tree converges into the elephant in the room, the centralization of Rahen mission. Not only that this mission gives a permanent 5% administrative efficiency bonus, but is also necessary to complete the mission tree. You will require to control less than 20 subjects among other things. There is no magic button to do this, so a lot of manual annexation is necessary. This mission also stifles expanding the rush too much. Ideally, the Synaptia and Prabia should be encouraged to conquer each other as much as possible. The AI will do so to some extent, but in many cases it will leave OPMs alive for no reason or not fully annex some nations. Bottom line is you need to get rid of vassals one way or the other until less than 20 remain. On another hand, annexing subjects in Yanshen and Bomdan is awkward due to the requirements of the Rachenization of Bomdan and Tiger upon the Yanhe missions. These two missions require that all provinces in the two regions are fully pacified, stated and most importantly have the owner's religion. This is problematic due to the fact that the righteous path and its heresies are prevalent here. Your high philosophy subjects will not convert the lands and will adopt the estate privilege that this allows conversions, so you are left to either annex and manually convert or encourage the righteous path nations to hold all the provinces with these religions in order to fulfill the requirements. Once all of the previously mentioned mission requirements are overcome, the final boss is made available. Second and final Harim Raj is a mission that frustrated me quite a bit, especially on my first run. This mission requires all of your owned provinces in Hales to have the high philosophy religion, be fully stated and have 25 development each. This means that you need to plan your conquests in Hales carefully, avoid expanding into the centaur plains and most likely give up a lot of provinces, especially jungles, deserts and mountains. So, after reducing your vassal count to less than 20, you are then forced to then release nations or give up a lot of lands in order to fulfill the final mission. Otherwise, developing all provinces to 25 will simply be impossible. It might be more efficient to simply release independent nations in some areas and then reconquer them after fulfilling the mission requirements or granting lands to your vassals and then annexing them back. Either way, it's a terrible chore and I feel like it held me back from my conquest for no good reason. The reward of this mission, alongside many permanent claims across Hales and a fairly strong final buff to the nation, is access to the best idea set in the game. But we'll get there. There are two more highlights that I'd like to mention regarding the relationship with the dwarves and the hobgoblins. The Peridot King offers a permanent claim on the Peridot Dwarf hold of Grozumdir. This should be conquered as soon as possible, and as a result, the Peridot promise is fulfilled by releasing the Dwarven nation of Grozumdir as an autonomous vassal. They are in a perfect situation to be granted control over all of the Serpent Spine north of Rachen, and will provide a strong fighting force, as long as they stay an autonomous vassal. As a consequence of the Dwarven mission subset, their population will be included in the casts, granting additional artillery combat ability, construction cost and lowered interest per annum. On the right side, once the command is broken and their lands completely conquered, integrating the Hobgoblin population leads to the Tiger Hobgoblin faction to be created in the Raja's lands. They can be gradually introduced into the caste system as well, granting further general cost reduction and more goods produced, but the way to success is a bit awkward. Among other things, all owned Hobgoblin cultures must be converted to Tiger Hobgoblin while having at least 8 Tiger Hobgoblin provinces. Purging or expelling is not an option, but this is where the Peridot King may help. Granting them all the lands in the Jade Mines will accelerate the mission requirements and by manually converting 5 random provinces in Shamakad to Tiger Hobgoblin culture, the mission's requirements can be fulfilled easier. There's much more to talk about, with many other strong permanent and temporary buffs to be had as mission rewards from this rich mission tree, but the ones mentioned earlier are the ones that gave me personally the most trouble. The marvelous final reward of the mission tree is really the ability to form the Harim Raj. Of course, there is the option to form the Rahen Raj if humans are accepted in the upper castes. The differences lie in the idea sets and the Rachen Raj pales in comparison to its Harimari counterpart. Another major change is that when forming either one, the Raj system will be dissolved. The tier 1 and tier 4 government reforms are lost and the classical feudal nobility is adopted instead. 
the current Synaptia and Prabia remain as they are, so it might be wise to maximize the number of Prabia for easier annexation if you choose to do so. All other new subjects will be regular vanilla vessels. The Harim Raj ideas are perhaps the strongest in the game for a world conqueror. The challenge is to unlock them fast enough to take full advantage of them. First of all, we have 5% extra administrative efficiency, which combines with the 5% from missions and 5% from Harimari administration. Then we get 20% core creation cost reduction, 10% less aggressive expansion impact, minus 5 years of separatism, together with plus 2 tolerance of the true faith and 1 extra point of general unrest reduction, which allows for overextension with minimal to no consequences. Some military bonuses in the form of infantry and cavalry combat ability and 10% extra morale of armies are welcome to the party. Three extra promoted cultures together with the mission rewards and other bonuses bring us to a total of 20 accepted cultures late game. Finally, there is also a 10% government capacity bonus. Even with this one, government capacity will be the biggest problem in a world conquest, mainly due to the immense development in Hales. Last but not least, the distinctive pink lotus color of the Harim Raj stands out from so many others in a way that can look amazing or disgusting. I'm still not sure which is the case for me, but I am definitely intrigued by this look. In the end, I feel like the Raj's major strong point is the amount of options that the campaign has. I am sure that the addition of Sarhal will make it even more interesting. Denizhan Raj is also in a strong position for a colonization game, with the caveat that jumping to Alentir from Rahen is a bit difficult at this stage of the game's development. I feel that many of the idea sets are viable. Influence ideas are almost mandatory. True, but the rest are all very good options and can help addressing the mission tree in various ways. As annoying as it is, the centralization of Rahen mission does have its place. With the Raj mechanics being as they are, it is one thing that stops the Raj from vassalizing the whole world too quickly. But hey, this is also an option. Just expanding the Raj indefinitely and taking it from there is also a fun concept, so there we go. I particularly enjoy this style of undetai play in a region. I am reminded of the Vanilla Japan experience, where I am completely zoomed in on the Nippon Islands until the unification of Japan, when I can finally zoom out and take a look at the rest of the world. I have had a similar feeling from the Raj, even though it was not so laser focused. External politics do stay relevant as well, even if managing the subjects is a very detailed and energy intensive affair. I will take a break from Rahen, but I am certain I will return to try out some of the other nations here at some point. But Denizhan Raj was a wonderful journey. Apologies for the low level of storytelling, but as you can see, just tackling the mechanics of this country took two whole videos. I will try to do something more lyrical the next time we meet. Thank you so very much to my Patreons, so thank you Baconomics, thank you Casimir Overell, thank you Dan Lambert, thank you Darth Mozart, thank you Michael VR, and thank you Thor's Main. May the moons light your path.